Dovetail is a place for people. People that need help, and that's all of us at one time or another. We need different kinds of help, maybe. We get a lot of people down at Godtail who have spiritual problems, obviously, sometimes emotional problems, sometimes mental problems, sometimes just financial problems. But Godtail is not primarily a place to give people a roof over their head and food to eat. Godtail is a place whereby we can tell people about Jesus Christ. Godtail is a school. It's my school. It's my wife's school. It's the people that work for God tell the school. It's a place whereby we can learn how to minister to people, how to love people, and all the people that cooperate in this effort get to be part of what's going on at God tell. God is a God of miracles, and that's what you're seeing down at God tell. You're seeing God perform some things in a very subtle, quiet way, and yet a job gets done that outside of the supernatural would not get done. Um, anybody have uh, Montana mentioned to me she had a prayer request does anybody else what, what is your prayer request my friend Casey um, kidney, kidney failure wow mm. and how old is he he's almost 18 he's got about 8 months worth mm. so. that's hard yeah. anybody else have something on your heart I got a friend over in Syria serving in the Air Force Oh, okay. Need to live in military up. Okay. Yeah, always. Yes, for sure. All right. Well, let's go, Lord, in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for this day that we can come and and we can gather together and read your word. Lord, I pray for um. I do pray for our military and I pray for our uh, men and women who put their lives um, at risk. Um, for our country and for the things that our country um, believes is important. But Lord, I also pray for those leaders that we would have better leadership, we'd have godly leadership, and we'd engage in the things that we should actually be engaged in. Lord, I pray for Montana's friend. Um, it's a hard, hard situation. And Lord, you don't always heal bodies, but you can heal hearts and you can heal souls. And so I pray that um, whatever time he has left, that he has a relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, <coughs> I was going to I was gonna play a song that my sister wrote, and uh, I decided not to. And... Uh, I apologize, I don't have a whole lot of voice. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try. On top of Calvary's hill, sinless blood did spill. Shed to forgive sin for all who enter in. I'm not ashamed, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed, I'm not ashamed. I pass from death into life. Thank God I saw the light. Religion's not the case I met Jesus face to face His glory blinded me His love set me free I'm not ashamed I'm not ashamed Of the gospel of Christ I'm not ashamed I'm not ashamed I passed from death into life Thank God not believe, but Jesus died 
died for you He'll wash away your sin If only you let him in And be not ashamed Be not ashamed Of the gospel of Christ Be not ashamed Be not ashamed You pass from death into life Thank God You saw the light I'm not ashamed I'm not ashamed Of the gospel of Christ I'm not ashamed I'm not ashamed I pass from death into life Thank God I saw the light I'm not ashamed Thank you, son. Those of you who don't know, that's Josiah. My name is the last son, and the preacher today is Michael, our oldest. I've never, I wrote that song. Yes. Um, I, I've, ne I've never been able to uh, to sing it. Um, but it is, it is to me, it's the gospel. Uh, I mean, it's exactly what Paul, what happened to Paul, you know. And it, it comes from what we're studying uh, here in Romans, you know, in Romans chapter 1. Um, so if you we'll open up, we'll look at Romans 1, verses 16 and 17 is where we'll begin. Where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe, to the Jew and to the Gentile, or to the Greek in, in one translation. You know, the gospel is um, it's very wide and it's very narrow at the same time. And, and by that I mean this, that the gospel is presented to everyone. Yes, that's how wide it goes. It, 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 the gospel can save every person on the planet that's ever been here. But it's very narrow because it's only applied to those who believe. And there's a big difference between believing um, with our head you know, which is just uh, what we call mental assent, um, and believing here with our soul, with our heart, with, our, with, our, with everything here uh, in true faith. Um, there's a big difference. Uh, and, you know, Paul, you know, I can't even imagine the difficulties Paul had to face in presenting the gospel to to the world around him because like it was the gospel of Christ you know this was like the, the new ideology on the block type thing to, to most of those people they, they would have thought well where, where did this new thing come from you know this new way of thinking where, where, where does this but it wasn't I mean Sometimes we think of in terms of Old Testament and New Testament. Look, there's one Testament, okay? This is all there is, really, okay? And, and, and Jesus Christ is the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. That This is all about Him from beginning to end, okay? Um, so it wasn't new, but for a lot of people, they, they thought this is a new thing. I mean, even the, even the, the Jews who had the Torah and understood, you know, that God had created the world. They even had prophecies about that a Messiah would come. They did not comprehend who Jesus really was, and that they had those Christians there, or those those Jewish people there in in uh, Israel who got to meet him and see him and hear him. They really didn't know who they saw and what they heard, for the most part. A select few did. Okay. So the challenges that Paul had in presenting the gospel um, was very, very difficult. Um, at 
That's why I think he says the gospel is the power. And we're going to look at some of these words. But he says the gospel is the power of God. And then, see, we have to have something that can pierce through our understanding. Something that can overcome our knowledge. You know, if you don't have, I'm going to say, say it this way, I don't really like the word religion, but, but I'm going to use it in this term. If you don't have a religion that challenges you, then you never have a God that you can submit to or that could even save you. So, and I'll say that in a different way in a minute because I wrote it down this morning, but the gospel is going to be um, offensive, even though it's not meant to... Uh, to cause offense, that's not the point of the gospel. The gospel is there to save us, okay? But it's going to be offensive to the way we think in our natural mind. It's going to be. There's going to be things that challenge us. And that's a good thing, okay? And we can understand that in simple human terms. I mean, just you take a fourth grader, and they're in a classroom, and you present them new material, and they say, well, I don't, I don't, I don't like this. I don't, I don't want to learn this. I don't know what the point of this is. Well, we understand that. Well, we're gonna to have to help you through this because this knowledge is difficult for the fourth grader because it's more than the fourth grader can comprehend. The gospel is the same way, and sometimes we approach the gospel and we say, "Well, I don't like what the Bible says about that." Well, okay. You don't like it. But if you allow the Lord to open your understanding, then you can see, oh, wait a second. I get it now. This yeah. is, yeah, I get it. And this is for my benefit. For this is helping me. This is not to harm me. This is not meant to say I'm terrible, although we are terrible. But that's not the point. <coughs> He's saying, I love you more than you are terrible. Right? That's what the God. So Paul says, I am not ashamed. Let's look at that first word. I'm not ashamed. That's what it says in verse 16. For I'm not ashamed. And shame can be, I wrote some notes down. Let me find them. Uh, let's just think of the word shame for a moment. Ashamed. Uh, another way he could say it is then, he, says, I, he could say, I am not embarrassed. I'm not embarrassed about the gospel. Um, on an intellectual level, he's not embarrassed. The gospel is, can handle scrutiny, okay? It, it can handle debate. In, it has. It has, right? It has. It has for thousands of years, right? There's more books written about, about Scripture than there are on any other subject on the planet. And the, it's funny, I, I, I've met people even recently in the last few years who say, well, I, you know, I, I, I did some research and uh, none of that's true. And I go, do you know how many volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes of books have been written about this? Just to explain the truth of it. And you're going to do research, you know, probably on a Google search for about 45 minutes and say, yeah, I don't believe that. I mean, come on. Look. There's a lot who say that. The gospel has changed the world. Okay, it has. It has changed the world. But Paul says, I'm not embarrassed. Um, he's not embarrassed or ashamed of his association with Christ. You have to understand that, I mean, Paul and those other uh, apostles they were living in the wake of the fact that their leader was crucified. And then they were sought out and they were imprisoned and they were stoned and they were beaten. And, they, and he says, I'm not ashamed to be associated with this. When a lot of people, and let's, let's be honest, look, 
I served in the military. Some of us have served in the military. I would not make a good POW. Okay? Because the first time they came to me and said, we're going to pull one of your fingernails out if, if you don't give us the information, I'd be like, hey, what, what, what do y'all want to know? I mean, I'll make up something if you just leave my fingernails alone, okay? I'm not, I, you know what I'm saying? I, I don't want to be in, in, in pain. and I don't want, I don't want to suffer that. Just let's be, be honest. Hey, Paul said, I'll die for the gospel. He didn't just say, I'll die for the gospel. You know what's worse than dying? To me, what's worse than dying for the gospel is what he said when he said, I was beaten five times with the rod and I was whipped three times with the cat of nine tails and I was left naked and, and, and hungered and peril and, and, and left to drown. And I don't want to go through it. Death is like, okay, I'm done. It's right? I, could you imagine someone taking a bull whip with pieces of metal on it and beating you on the back and opening you up? Not just once, not just twice, but three times in your lifetime. And then you would still say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed to be associated with Jesus Christ. See, most people, most of us in this world, would, we don't want to go through that. I've, so I've read a lot, lot of uh, Fox's Books of Martyrs, and, and, and it talks about how different people throughout the centuries, you know, the, the things they went through. And I remember seeing or reading, like, um, people that were, were nailed to a cross and then lit on fire. And the whole time they were burning to death, they were singing hymns and praises to God. I don't know how you do that. I'll be honest, I don't know how you do that. Like, I can't go in my mind and think, oh, yeah. they did it, I can do it. Uh, no, I can't. that has to be a special power from God in that moment. It's cool in the furnace. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Shadrach. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, what they say? They said, hey, we're not going to bow to the king. If God doesn't deliver us, that's fine. That's fine. So... How do, you, how do you do that? He said, well, I'm not ashamed. He said, I'm not ashamed. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is, so let's look at that word. The gospel is the good news. And a lot of times we kind of stop there. It is good news. But you have to know the bad news before you can appreciate the good news. And I think too many times we spend time thinking or just telling people, hey, do you want to go to heaven? Everybody says yes. Well, say this prayer and then you get to go. And that's the good news. You get to go to heaven. Look, we need to understand that we are under the wrath of God. Always under attack. God created us. Man rebelled against him. And in that rebellion, we are under his wrath. That's not a popular message. But unless we understand that not only am I under his wrath, but I deserve to be under his wrath. And that I can't get out from under his wrath unless something happens that is outside of my ability. Amen. That's the gospel. So he's not ashamed, Paul says, of the gospel, the good news. Another way to say that gospel is um, we need to understand that the gospel is the teachings of Christ, that he is the substitutionary sacrifice. Substitution means in our place. He made a sacrifice in our place. He took the wrath of God. He took the penalty of our sin. Look, I, I challenge you and anybody that you know, you go and search and search and search and find another religion or philosophy that tells you somebody else is going to take your place. You're not going to find it. The gospel is the revelation of Christ. It is it's God loving us so much that he says, you know what? These people have put themselves in a pickle and they can't get themselves out of this situation. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to go and I'm going to have to be like them. I'm going to walk the walk. I'm going to I'm going to be tempted. I'm going to I'm going to go through the struggle. 
I'm going to allow myself to be at their mercy in, in, the, in the physical. As I've said it before, he allowed himself to be killable and mankind killed him. But he, it's a substitutionary. He said, look, I have a place in heaven and you're under wrath, but I want you to go to heaven. So I'm going to take the wrath so you can take and you can be where I am. That puts chills down my back because I'm not worthy of it. Yeah. Not worthy of it. <clears throat> the gospel is the saving truth of God revealed to lost humanity. So Paul says, I'm not ashamed. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not afraid to be associated with with this gospel message, this message that reveals who Christ is to all of us. I'm not ashamed of that. And then he says, for it is the power of God. The power of God. This, I, I spent uh, uh, this whole week really just thinking about the power of God, the power of God, the power of God, the power of God. What does that mean? You know, like, to what it, and, and I... I there's no way I can exhaust it, and there's no way I can totally explain it. Well, I don't totally un even understand it, so I can't totally <laughs> explain it, okay? But he says this message, the gospel. I, I don't know if you get this. The gospel is the power. Look, look. It's not just about um, you know, sometimes we go to church and, and we we learn certain things about that church group or that that or we could say religion, okay? Or I'm a Baptist, so I learn Baptist things. Or I'm a Presbyterian, I learn all the things about Presbyterians. Or or I'm Catholic, I learn all the things about Catholic. Look, it's not about all that. It's about understanding that the gospel supersedes all that stuff that we would just say is kind of like dogma, okay? It supersedes all that. This is the power of God. What does that mean, the power of God? Look, the power of God is the power to take something that's dead and make it alive. And there's no philosophy on the planet that can do that. There's nothing out there. The gospel is the power of God to take something. <clears throat> Remember in the Old Testament, there was a time when the prophet was looking out over this valley and they had all these, all these dead bones, just bones, just laying around. And he said, prophesy over them. And his bones began to, to come back together and make full skeletons. And then he, then the, the Lord put meat on their, on their bones, put all the organs back. He breathed life into it. Some people say, oh, that never happened. Okay, well, whatever. You believe what you want to believe. I know that spiritually, I was dead. And I was taken from death to life. I was listening to Tim Keller, and he was talking about this time when he was uh, up in Pennsylvania at this church, and they were trying to um, to see about the men that were in the church. Uh, they were going to kind of, uh, I guess, I guess I don't use the word prom promote. I guess I don't like that word, but they were going to take some of the men in the church. They were going to make them elders, okay, in the church, and. Um, Several people had come in and and um, they asked them about their religious experience, you know, growing up or whatever, their salvation. And um, he said some of them said, several of them had said the same thing. They said, you know, I grew up in a church, but I never heard the gospel. I grew up in a church, but I never heard the gospel. And several, this happened like three or four times. And so one of the other men that was there said, let me tell you something. 
He said, there are people in this church right now that years from now they'll say, I grew up in church, but I never heard the gospel. Because what we need in order to really hear is we need the power of God to intervene in our life because a dead person can't hear. And what happened in their life was that, yes, they were grew up in a church, and yes, they knew some things about the Bible, but they didn't have a relationship with God, and what they needed was for God to intervene. They needed the Holy Spirit to come in. The Holy Spirit is that power. The Holy Spirit to come in and change them and breathe life into them so that they too could understand that they don't have to be ashamed to be associated with Jesus Christ. I have a, a guy that I knew, and well, Jenny and I knew him kind of, we weren't close, but we, we knew who the person was. <clears throat> um, he grew up in church, and uh, I'd had a, a couple conversations with him just over Facebook, you know, uh, just back and forth. He was an atheist, and, and um, so he grew up in church, and he had a knowledge, but then he went in the world, and he got a different knowledge, and he said, this knowledge is better than this knowledge. The problem was, is he didn't have life into any of that. He was just kind of, you know, debating among, in his own head, really, debating which is better. You know, is it Christianity or is it atheism? And unfortunately, he committed suicide. I hope that in those last moments that maybe he, he you know, I just hope that he, he came to know the Lord. It's, I know some people think, <coughs> think that if you die of suicide that you can't go to heaven. I, I, I dare say that that's, we don't know that. Let's not, let's not make that judgment. Okay? My two closest friends in the world committed suicide. I believe both of them had accepted Christ. But I also know that when you walk away from the Lord, you can get your mind can become so disoriented. You can become so depressed and, and, and you can just not want to be here to the point that you can, can do something wrong to yourself. Okay? But I do know this, that is, if a person accepts Christ, if they accept that gospel, the power of, uh, of, of God, which is that the gospel, they accept that in true faith and He comes and He lives inside of you, there's nothing that can take that away from you. Not even your own destruction of your life. I don't quite understand that either. Be, okay? I don't. Okay? Um, but I know it's true. Okay? So Paul says he's not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God into salvation is the next thing. Salvation we talked about last week is uh, in three different forms. It, it comes in justification, sanctification, and glorification. Those are big words. So I just kind of got to thinking, what are some of the things we can think, what other words can we use about salvation? And, and simply, it's healing. It's healing. It's healing for, for our souls. Okay? Um, and we need that healing. And you know, the thing is that everybody on the planet is looking for that healing. They really are. That's why people get depressed. That's why people get miserable. That's why people go through life and they say, I hear every person I've ever met has, have, has said this before at some point. Well, I just know there's something more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're right. There is. <laughs> there is. His name is Jesus Christ. And he's... In John chapter 14, it says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again, and I will take you unto myself so that where I am, you may be also. Yeah, that's something more. You know, for the people that say, well, I came from nothing, and there's really nothing after this, what they're saying is life has no significance at the beginning, and life has no significance at the end, which if that was true, then their life has no significance now. You, it is a sad way of thinking. But you can't go through life thinking that you're significant if you had no significant beginning and you have no significant end. 
See, I know whom I have believed in. I know who created mankind. He didn't create me. He didn't, God didn't create me. He created Adam and Eve. Okay? I was generated by a mother and a father. And because I was generated by a mother and father, I was generated into humanity where sin already is it's permeated all the way through it. Mm -hmm. So I was born under the wrath of God already. And that's why I need Him to come in and do something that I cannot do. Salvation is healing, but it's also safety. I need a place of refuge. That's what salvation is. It's a place where I can be forgiven. You know, forgiveness is a difficult thing. We've gone through life and people have hurt us. And we have a difficulty forgiving them. And we've gone through life and we've hurt other people. And we have a hard time forgiving ourselves. But God's forgiveness is more than we can possibly understand. Mm. And I love how the scripture says that he takes our sins and he places them into the sea of forgetfulness. Doesn't mean that he forgets. It means that because he loves us and he forgives us, he doesn't bring it back up. He does, there's never that time when you're going to the Lord to ask him, Lord, I need help. And he goes, you know, I'd like to help you, but man, you remember that time you did such and such? I mean, you've asked me this before, man. Now, when, when are you going to stop asking me for the same thing? He doesn't do that. That's what we do. We do it, we do it to each other, right? Or we think that about ourselves. We even think in prayer, well, I can't ask him about this because, man, I asked him yesterday. And then I went and messed up already. He doesn't think that way. He says, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you because it's easy and light. See, he has a different approach to us because of love and because he already took the penalty for our sins. Salvation is healing for our souls that will last eternity. So he says, I am not ashamed. That's a key word that we need to look at. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That's a key word we need to look at. For it's the power, that's a very important word for us to understand here. Unto salvation, we need to understand those things. Looking to, a lot of times people don't share the gospel with other people because they don't understand those four words in that verse right there. Yeah, that's it. Because they're going to be challenged in that conversation and people are going to say something like, well... If God made me, then why am I already under his wrath? But what they're, they're, what they're forgetting, what, they, what they're not looking at, is that in Genesis, Adam and Eve rebelled against God. Yeah. What they're not looking at is the fact that they have rebelled <coughs> against God. <coughs> See, we all want to think that we're just fine the way we are. And that everybody should accept me the way I am. Look, nobody accepts you the way you are. That's just the truth. If you haven't figured that out in life, you need to figure it out. Nobody accepts you the way you are, not even you. Matter of fact, you are probably the person that doesn't accept you the most. Look in a mirror for 45 seconds. Look in a mirror. And you'll walk away going, well, I don't like that, and I don't like that, and I wish I had this, and, you know, that's right. Am I not right? Well, what if you had a mirror, and you were looking at your heart? You wouldn't accept you the way you are. You would know that your heart needs some fixing. You would know there's some grudges, or some bitterness, or some unforgiveness. You would know that there's some habits that need to go away, Right? Y'all, are you with me? You, you would know that, right? Well, if you know that, then wouldn't we be drawn to somebody who would love us 
in spite of all that and say, you know what? I'm going to work in you and through you and we're going we're gonna to change some of that. It may take 50 years or 60 years or 70 years but every day that I'm working on you you're going to know that you're loved unconditionally. That's what the gospel does. <clears throat> some people don't like it though. They want to stay away. As I said before, some, sometimes they, they look at the Bible and they look at certain things and they go, well, I don't agree with that. I wrote this down this morning. It says, to stay away from Christianity because certain teachings upset you assumes that if there is a God, he wouldn't have any view different from yours. I'll read it again. To stay away from Christianity because certain teachings upset you assumes that if there is a God, that he would not have any views different from yours. Look, you can't even find a person that agrees with you 100%. How are you going to find a God that, that agrees with you? Right? Well, what we need to do is we need to be illuminated in our mind so that we can agree with God. We need to think with God. We need to agree with God. Look, there's things in this Bible that I read and I do not like them. And if you read the Bible, you're going to find things that you do not like. But it's irrelevant whether I like it or not. And we know that just in life. There's things that are going to happen today that you don't like, that you're going to have to deal with. And you can make a choice whether you're going to deal with it properly or deal with it improperly. And if you deal with it improperly and somebody calls you on it, you're going to say, well, I didn't like that. And they're going to say, so? You still have a responsibility to deal with it properly. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So there's things that I disagree with. Not, I don't disagree with them. I just don't like them. Okay? I don't, I don't like... Here's one. I, mean, I think we can all kind of identify. I don't like that I'm asked to forgive. I don't like that. I would rather forgive somebody after they've been smashed into the ground. And, I, and then I could go, ha! That's what you get. Forgive you. All right? I mean, that, that would feel a lot better, right? Just, I'm just being honest. I appreciate it. But it would, be, it would be wrong. And the Bible tells me that if I can't forgive my brother, then I don't need to come and, and ask him for anything. Right? So I said, oh, okay, I have a responsibility. Even though God is sovereign, and he's in control, and he loves me, and he's going to give me the power, ability, capability to do what he's asked me to do, I still have a responsibility to do it. Ah. Oh. Okay, Lord. All right, Lord. It's like a short checklist. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, right. So you're <clears throat> I want to just touch on, and then we will, we'll, we will not go too deep into some other verses, though. <clears throat> so I'm going to read these verses again. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. Then he says, for then uh, therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Where is the righteousness of God revealed? In the gospel. In the gospel as it's applied to me. As it, so as the gospel is applied to me, as he illuminates my mind, right? He, he forgives me and he, he begins to reveal, okay? He says, therein is the righteousness of God revealed. The so I can begin to understand just at a minute amount of of how righteous and how holy God actually is. Now this is important. I need to see this a little bit more every day. Because as I see this more and more every day, what it causes is it causes my faith to increase. And as my faith increases, then that process 
of sanctification, which is going to take a whole lifetime, it actually makes it a little easier, okay, as I'm living by faith. And then the world around me can say, wait a second, there's something different about him. I knew him when he was in high school. Or I knew him when he was in the military. I knew him when he was in college. And that's not the same guy. Something's different about him. Ah, oh, you know why? Something's different about me? Because God came, I put my faith in him. And then he revealed his righteousness to me in a different way. And he's changing me every single day. So... For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. He says from faith to faith. That means that beginning faith. And that means that walking out of faith for the rest of our lives. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And that right there is huge. The just shall. What does shall mean? It will happen. Right? It's determined. It will happen. A friend of mine used to have a saying, and I keep saying I'm going to put it on a t-shirt one day. I may have even said it here before. But it said, no, N-O, right? No, Jesus, no change. You're not going to change without Jesus. But then it says, K-N-O-W, says, no, Jesus, no change. You want to know change? Know Jesus. Because, see, the thing is that Christ overcame death. He defeated death. Right? So how does something that is infinitely alive come into me and then leave me the same way that I was? Well. Cannot happen. Cannot. You shall. That's what he says. He says, the just shall. If you've been justified, what does justification mean? It is a legal term. We talked about this last week. If I'm justified, if I go before the judge and I'm justified, that means I walk out of there, I'm a free man. Not only am I free of penalty, I'm free of accusation. Because the devil is the accuser of the brethren. And so when he comes and says, you're such and such, and you're such and such, and you're such and such, don't believe him. Don't believe the devil. Tell him, you need to talk to my attorney. You need to talk to the judge. You need to go back to the courtroom where I was. And I walked out of there, and I was free. You can't accuse me. I had someone a few years ago, five, six years ago, they, they wrote to me on Facebook. Everything happens on Facebook. So he wrote to me and said that I was a hypocrite. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. You don't know who you're talking to. I'm a child of God. Oh, I did some terrible things. And at times I lived as a hypocrite. But I'm not a hypocrite. Because I'm forgiven. There's a song by the Imperials. I don't know if anybody knows who the Imperials are. You know who the Imperials are? My favorite song by them is, I'm forgiven, now I got a reason for living. I sang it on the way to, uh, singing in the, in the car in my head. Jesus keeps giving and giving, giving till my heart overflows. I'm forgiven. See, the devil will tell you that you're not. The devil will tell you that you're no better today than you were when you were lost. Matter of fact, he'll tell you that you're worse because he'll say you're a hypocrite. Because you still make mistakes. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. You have to learn what the voice of the devil sounds like. You have to learn that. You know how you learn it? You know how you learn? Listen to yourself. Well, we're going to talk about that later. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, though, the way you learn is right there. It says... The, uh, says the, the righteousness of God is revealed so I can know what the devil sounds like when I'm learning to know what God sounds like. As I begin to see the revelation of who God is and what he is in my experience and what he's doing with my life and what he's going to do with me for eternity, as that becomes more and more real to me, when somebody comes to talk to me 
and tells me something that's different from that, that's the devil. And the devil is a liar. And I don't have to listen to that. Look, I have a lot of conversations with myself. Sometimes I walk away thinking I'm schizophrenic. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm being honest. I mean, sometimes I talk to myself so much. Because I have to, and my wife taught me these words. She said, you have to listen to your self-talk. You have to listen to yourself. What are you telling yourself? And so I have to ask myself, what am I telling myself, Michael? If it's not coming from here and who, who, who God has um, said he is, and as he's revealing that, if it's not from that, then I don't need to be telling myself that. I need to be telling myself what he says. Mm -hmm. For then the, therein the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, that as it's written, the just shall live by faith. I'm going to read one more verse, and then I'm going to ask you, well, I'm going to read, because I'm going to go to the period, two more verses. I want to ask you just to, to, to think about these two verses over the next week. <coughs> um, <coughs> the thesis statement, as I said before, of Romans is Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 17. The rest of what happens after this is explaining this okay so he says in verse 18 he says for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteous or ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth of unrighteousness who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it unto them we're going to go there it's going to the next time we speak um, that's where we'll be <clears throat> the truth is that <clears throat> God has revealed to us who he is I don't know where you are I don't know if you've accepted that you know I'm a dad and I have um I have children that some are here. Most of them are not here, right? I have grandchildren. Um, I have children that are my wife's children that I I care deeply about. Okay, so I'm a stepdad, or maybe I'm just a a guy. I don't know. <laughs> and I look at my children and I go, you know, I don't know. I don't know where their hearts are. I don't know. <coughs> I don't know that if I, or when, I don't know that when I die and I go to heaven, if I'm ever going to see them again. I don't know. You know, we like to think that um, our loved ones are all going to be in heaven with us when we get there. But we don't know. We don't know. But I know I, I know that I can do this. And I know that you can do this for the people that you love. Is that you can pray. And you can pray. And you can pray. That God reveals himself to them. In such a way that they cannot say no. In such a way that they will never doubt. In such a way that they will put their faith in him not just on one day but on every day for the rest of their lives it doesn't mean they're going to be perfect it doesn't mean any of us are ever going to be perfect okay but I know this that um, if he does come in or when he comes into our lives <coughs> he changes us he changes the things that we want, which sometimes makes even a, a more of a struggle as we're going through that. You know, you're kind of letting go of one thing and you're trying to grasp on the other thing. There's a struggle there, right? But he's there in the middle of it. And he will gradually... Well, some people, it happens automatically. You know, some people, they, they get saved, boom, they're gone, right? I mean, they are just on fire for the Lord and they're going to be that way for the rest of their lives. <laughs> 
My dad was like that. Yeah. My dad was like that. Okay. Some of us, we, we're a little slower. Maybe we're dumber. When we're hard-headed. I don't know. I mean, I'm hard-headed, so that may be me. But I know this, is that when he comes in, though, he will continue to work and work and work and work and change us. Not just so that we're better people. That's a byproduct. You know what I want him to change the most in me? Is I want him to show me how to love him and love people more. That's really all I want. But he will. He will. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your love for us. I thank you that the gospel is power. And it's not just a power, but it says that it is the power of God unto salvation so that we can live a life that's radically different from the lost world, from when we were lost, because we can live a life of continued healing. We have a place of refuge and safety in the arms of Christ. We know that we can walk through this life and we're never alone again. So, Lord, I pray that you will make these truths real to us. Lord, burden our hearts for the people around us that do not know you. Burden our hearts for those that say they know you, but we, we just don't know. And, Lord, I'm, I'm not their judge. I can't pass sentence on them. So, Lord, really what I want is I want them to come to a place where They're not under a sentence, but they're under the forgiveness of Christ and the grace of God. In Jesus' name, amen.